get one thing, grab another. Maybe. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. Brother Jimmy bought me. I knew he was right with God when he brought it to me. I knew he'd been walking with the Lord all week that week. <laughs> Unlike some of you other lost people in here. Amen. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 through 33. First Corinthians 10, verses 31 through 33. Whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this day. The opportunity we have to share it together. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us and guide us in all your truth. And Father, I know it's been said, but we thank you for the rain. Father, we just thank you for all the things that you bless us with. And so many times that we failed to even mention. Father, we look around and or we can spend the rest of this time this morning just praising <coughs> you. The things that you continually give us, that you pour out on us. Father, we are forever grateful for your love, for your mercy and grace, Lord, that you show us each day. Father, the greatest picture of all of us, in Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, be with us as we share your word, and may you speak to our hearts. Lord, may our hearts be receptive, Lord, to what the Holy Spirit has for us to hear today. Father, I pray as always, the words of my mouth, meditation in my heart, may they be pleasing in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. amen. I tell you what, I don't even know if I've got my voice, but I'm still going to preach in case you want to. But it's going to be strange, I'm afraid. Uh, so, hang on. This week, in the Sunday school lesson, and I won't do this every week, but remember the verse that we talk about if you're in the uh, in the series that the adults are in, uh, the Gospel Project. And one of the verses this week was 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 says, Whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And that's really what's part of the, the, the lesson. And, you know, like I said, I won't do this every week, but as preparing for the class, that verse really stuck with me. And here was a question that I began to ask myself. I think God went on my heart was, what does it mean for me to live in a way that brings glory to God? Because we look at life and we, and look, life hits hard many times. Amen? And for some of us today, it may be as hard as it's ever been. I don't know where you are and you walk with God and life and where you are in general, but I know this. God has a specific purpose for us. And sometimes we get caught up in seeking out other things and we miss out what He would have us to do. We miss out the very reason He has created us. And it always helps me to go back and realize that God <coughs> created me specifically, uniquely, for a purpose for this time in all of history to be used by Him. And that makes me feel pretty good about God's love for me. And whether anybody says it or not, and we talked about it earlier, if anybody says it or not, we are all special because the one who has created us. Think about it. It has nothing to do with what I've done. It's obvious. It has all to do with the one who created us. And when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, 
whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I want to share with you this morning, what does it mean to live a life that brings glory to God? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he begins to talk about the things that people have done in the past that he says you need to avoid. And so if we're going to glorify God, there are things in life that we need to avoid. There are also things in life we need to pursue and to seek after. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll look back at verse 1 and follow. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses and the cloud and the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. And they were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them. The rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they laid low in the wilderness. And so he talks about Israel. He talks about the people of God and all the things that took place. And he says that, they all ate the same spiritual food, verse 3. They all drank the same spiritual drink. They were drinking from a spiritual rock, which followed them, and the rock was Christ. He says, but even, but even with that, nevertheless, he says, and that word means, even so, with most of them, God was not well pleased. Verse 6 begins to explain why. Now these things happen as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. You know what he says? He says, not only do we learn the truth from God's word about the children of Israel, but we also learn about the things to avoid. He also uses them as an example to us of, of not to follow in some of the paths that they took. It's not to say that they were always on the out of what God wanted them to do. That's not the case. But when they make mistakes, God says, look, I have shown you these examples that you might learn from. Them. You know, we talk about all the time about learning from mistakes, about learning from of shortcomings in our lives or learning from failures. You hear that? Say, well, look, God said it long ago. He says, look, avoid these things. And here's what he said in chapter 10. He said in verse 6, he says, they've happened as examples for us so that we will not crave evil things as they also <coughs> crave. You know what he says? He says, avoid the evil that is out there. The world is filled with evil. And a preacher said one time, he said, you know what? He said, he said, I'm, he said, I'm just about convinced that there's an evil spirit behind every bush. And what he meant by that was, everywhere you turn, there's evil. Everywhere you turn, there's seduction. Everywhere you turn, there's that appetite that, there, that seduction is trying to draw us in to whatever it may be. And the truth is, Satan knows your weakness. He knows the very spot you're weak in. He knows the very spot that I'm weak in. He knows every weak spot that we have. He knows where we struggle. And the truth is, my weak spot may not be yours and vice versa. But it doesn't matter about what weak spot is where. The truth is, he's out there to seduce us. He's out there to draw us to that evil. And God says in his word, he says, avoid. He says, what you need to do is that you would not crave evil things as they also crave. He says in verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. You know, he says, do not be idolaters. Now, I'm convinced that if we were to search every home that's represented here, we probably won't find a carbon, a carved image or a molded image from some gold in our homes that we bow down and worship before. I understand that. You won't find them in our home. We don't have the statues there. But I can tell you this. When we're out of tune with God in every heart, there's something there that we're putting before God. It doesn't have to be a car, dude. It could be lots of things in life. But here's what he said. He said, you need to avoid idolatry. And here's what the world says. Get all you can while you're here. Make all you can make. Buy all you can buy. Get all you can get. Spend all you can. All these things that is over and over again. And it's bombarded. You're not a success unless you reach this level. You're not a success until you reach this pinnacle of life. You're not a success. You're a failure until you get here or there. And that's what, is bombarded, what bombards us every single day. And God says, look, look at the examples before. Do not put anything before me. That's what the Lord says. That's easier said than done. 
It can be a hobby. It can be a loved one. It can be work. It can be all sorts of things. Play. Look, I love to play with the best of them. In fact, I've been pumped up for a couple weeks about getting together with my buddy and playing fantasy football. Amen? And y'all say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It may be to you, but when you get saved, you'll understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> but you know what? It's not even about that. Sorry about that. Not really. But it's about getting together in the fellowship. Here's what I got on my mind. The last thing I heard was, hey, we're grilling out burgers and broths. And I said, I'm in. I'm in. But I love to play. I love that. There's something out there that I do outside of all the other things that are on my plate. And it makes it laugh at me sometimes and say, you're a big kid. I think you're exactly right. It is a release, but I'm going to tell you something. If it comes before God, then it's now becoming an idol. I love my family. I give my life on right now without hesitation, just like you or yours. But if they come before my relationship with God, two things. First of all, they become an idol. And number two, I'll never be the husband and the father and the spiritual leader that I'm called and created to be if they ever take the place of God in my life. Amen. Does God want me to love them with everything that I have? Yes, he does. Does he want me to lead them with every ounce of energy and fiber that he has created in my being? Does he want me to protect them and all the things? Absolutely. But I can only do it in a way that glorifies him when he is before them. Doesn't mean he loves them any less. He loves them so much he gave Jesus to die for them just like he did for me. Work. We ought to give all that we have. It's not easy sometimes. But the truth is, it should never become an idol before God. It should never come before him. And there are other things in life, whether it be relationships or whatever. But he says, avoid, he says, then, sorry, verse 7, he says, do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and stood up to play. So in verse 8, he says, nor let us act immorally, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. You know what else he says? He says, avoid immorality. Don't you understand something? If the world's screaming a word today, it's do whatever it is to please yourself and forget about what God's word says. That's what the world says. You know what the lie is? You're not hurting anybody else. Nobody says, do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever it is to gratify your own desires. And the truth is, God says, avoid immorality. Of all kinds, by the way. I know that when you talk about immorality, as a church, I know they're pick and choose. We think that some of them are more, more gross than the sin than the others, but I'm going to tell you something. They're all sin in the eyes of God. All of them. Any sexual relationship outside the confines of husband and wife, man and woman in marriage, is sin in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter about the rest of them. It doesn't matter how long you've been together. It doesn't matter how strong the love is. Like, I'm not telling you you don't have to preach what you love. But you don't have to hear my heart is. I'm telling you. God says it's a blessing from Him. It's a gift from Him. And when it's used the way that He desires for it to, it is a blessing in the life of a husband and wife. But I know we pick and choose those. We make excuses why it's okay and we do all these things. But the truth is, He says, avoid all immorality. And anything that veers from God's perfect plan for us is sin. Whatever it may be. And, and, and the world, look, you can't turn from one place to another without an image that's graphic or all these things that are infiltrated in our hearts. And when we let Satan get a foothold, he begins to destroy us. He begins to destroy us. And I'll tell you how you know if he's got you. If he has me, you, all of us. We start making excuses and compromising why we do what we do and why it's okay. That's the first red flag to know that we're not where God would have us to be. We start making excuses. We start making reasons why it's okay. But we start justifying sin in our own lives. And the truth is, that's the, that's the first thing God says. He says, look, he says, no one let us act immorally. 
as some of them did. And the penalty was, he said, 23,000 fell in one day. Verse 9, he says, Don't let us try the Lord as some of them did. And they were destroyed and were destroyed by the serpents. <laughs> Nor grumbled as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyers. Now these things have happened to them, or excuse me, these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. He says, don't grumble or try the Lord. You know what it says when we grumble? We're talking about hitting home in the last two weeks with me. Here's what we're saying to God. God, I'm not satisfied with what you have currently given me. You talk about hurt. Take it from a man who got hit hard by that. When you grumble about the situation, you grumble about where you are, you grumble all this. You know what we're really saying to God? We're saying the same thing the children of Israel said, and that's just not enough, God. We appreciate that that's not enough. And he got more to give. When the truth is, he can't give any more than he already has through Jesus Christ. And the second thing is, he never holds back. He pours out his fullness on his people. So when I grumble, when we grumble, I'm telling you, we're saying to God, what you're giving is not enough for me. I'm no longer satisfied with what you have to offer. Because that's what grumbling does. It complains about where we currently are. I'm not telling you that you may not be in a tough situation and things may not be difficult for you. I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you it's easy. But he says, do not grumble as they did. They were destroyed by the destroyer. He says then, he says these things have happened as an example. In other words, he says, here's a warning to you. The warning is, don't do as they did. Because God has a better plan for us. God has a plan to bless us. It's not his desire to create man and to punish and for destruction and for the destroyer to come for those to be struck down. It's none of that. That's never what God's plan. His plan was, was to create us and he was spending eternity with us that we walk daily with him in an intimate, loving, growing relationship. And if we're not in the midst of that, it's because we have moved outside of God's will for us. God hadn't went anywhere. So what is it? As we talk about things to avoid, he says, avoid immorality. Avoid idolatry. He says, avoid grumbling. Verse 9, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed. You know what it means to try the Lord? It means we know good and well what his word says, but we continue to do the other thing <coughs> instead. That's what we're doing. So long we talk about it. We make all those excuses and we justify how we want to. But the truth is, James said, to him to know the right thing to do and not do it is sin. That's what James said. It's to try him, to test him. When we read God's word and we know what he has for us, but yet we still. Blatantly go out and say, you know what, I will do my thing instead. It's exactly what children of Israel did. You know what happened? It cost them dearly. Knowing what he wanted them to do. So what does it mean to glorify God in our life? What he said in verse 31 as we started. Whatever you do, eat, drink, or whatever. Do it all for the glory of God. 32 says, give no offense either to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God. You know who he covers in verse 32? Everybody. Jews, Greeks, and the church. That's, I'll tell you who he's covering here. It's not like there's three groups of people here. He's covering the entire human race. He says, Jews, Greeks, and the entire church do not cause them to stumble or offend them. And I know and I read this, and the preacher wrote this, and this is great. I don't know if he got it somebody else or not. But he said, you know what? When we offend, when the others are offended by the gospel, it's their problem. He said, but when others are offended by the way that we live out the gospel, it has now become our problem. I want you to hear that. He said, well, some people are offended by the gospel. I know they are, that's their problem. They'll stand before God one day, and they'll answer for everything in their life. I know people right now, if you can bring up the word Jesus, the name of Jesus, they get offended. I know that. That is their problem. 
But when people are offended by the way I live the gospel out in my life, then the problem is now mine. Not theirs, but mine by the way I live. And here's what he said. He says in verse 32, he says, Give no offense either to Jews or Greeks or the church of God. It's not a denomination there, by the way. Amen. He's just talking about all of us. Universal church of born-again believers cleansed by the blood of Jesus. He says in 33, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. See, the first thing he says is, here's what to avoid. Paul says in verse 31 through 33, especially 33, he says, my end goal is that people will be brought to Jesus. That they'll be brought to Christ. In other words, they'll see my life and say, you know what, it's real. Oh, they see the mistakes in me. But they look at life and say, you know what, he or she, they're real. Their relationship with God is real. I see it. <laughs> and because of that, they're drawn. Not by me or by you, but by the Holy Spirit. He draws them to himself. Paul says, I do all this. I do it all so that someone may be saved. In other words, because of the salvation of others. So we know what to avoid. We know what we are not to pursue after. But it's not just about avoiding. It's also about pursuing things of God. Look at verses uh, 12 and following. Therefore, let me think he stands, take heed that he does not fall. No temptation is overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so you will be able to endure it. You know, sometimes we misinterpret that scripture. Everybody says, God, you're putting your blood on you, and you can stand. I wouldn't say. That's what it's always said. God never put on me more than I can stand. That's not what that scripture said completely. Did you hear what he said? We'll read that again. He says, verse 13, No temptation is overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but what the temptation will provide their way of escape also, that you may be able to endure. You know what he says? When temptation comes, it is more than we can stand. That's why God reaches down and gives us an opportunity to grab hold of him and he says, I'll pull you through it if you'll reach out to me. Amen. i got news for you. I can't stand all that the world has to throw on me unless I'm reaching for the hand of Jesus. Amen. And you can't endure it either without the help of Christ and the power of God. He says, look, when that temptation comes, he didn't say that if it comes, but he says, when that temptation comes, he says, it won't overtake you if you will look to me and I'll give you a way of escape. You know what we do? We make excuses. I can't help it. This is my, one of the biggest theological disasters we do is this. I'm just a sinner. Can't help it. Sinner, saved in grace, always be a sinner. Let me tell you what scripture says. When you've been saved by the blood of Jesus, you're now a saint of God. That means we're perfect, far from it. One day we will be when God completes his work in us, and only when he returns and he and he finishes that work that he has begun in our hearts and our lives. But that's not what scripture says. That's an excuse to say, you know what, I all in, I'm serious to see it done. I'm just gonna grab a hold of it. I'm just gonna wallow in it. When Paul addressed the churches time after time, he called them saints. You know what it means? They have been saved, sanctified, and cleansed. By the blood of Jesus. They were no longer who they were used to be, but they were now someone that God had now made them to be in Christ. Amen. We need to quit making excuses while we're involved in sin and grab a hold of the power of God and allow Him to bring us through it unscathed with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. That's what we need to be about. And look, that's exactly what He says. He says, God is faithful. In verse 13, no temptation is overtaking you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful. You know what? If everybody around you lets you down, I want you to hear something. God is always faithful. When the people closest to you let you down, God is still faithful. And when the pastor lets you down, and you're disappointed and discouraged, and all the things he may or may not have done, look, I've been guilty of all. 
God is still always faithful. I'm going to tell you something else. When we put our trust in Him, we will never be disappointed. I love that verse. Right in the middle of that, he says, but God is faithful. You mean God can pull me out of what I'm in? I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what the temptation is, but God says, it's nothing uncommon to Him. He knows what it is. And He'll bring you through it if you let Him. You say, yeah, but bro, Ronnie, and all, this, and all that's going on in my life and the temptation is just too much for me to do. You know what he says? He'll provide the way of escape that you'll be able to endure it. Trust him. Reach for him. Reach out to him and let him pull you through. It's exactly what he says he'll do. I don't know about you, but I believe every word of God's word. When he says he's faithful, I'm convinced with all my being that he is faithful. Always. Verse 14, he says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from adultery. I speak to as to wise men, and you judge what I say. He says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Verse 18, he says, Look now at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat sacrifice shares in the altar? And he was talking about all things that was going on, that were going on. Verse 23, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. You know, one way that we, that one thing we pursue, and that is we pursue the edification of others above ourselves. You know what he wants us to do? He wants <coughs> us to put others before ourselves. Here's what he said. He says, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Verse 24, here's what they were talking about. What someone was eating, what someone was drinking. He says, well, you know, and, and, and Paul says, it's all lawful for me. I can do it. But the fact is, I won't do it because in their company it would cause them to stumble. And here's what I'm saying. If it causes your brother or sister to stumble, God says, get it out of your life. We always talk about that issue of drinking and all these things, and I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation. And here's what I'll tell people. Is it causing someone to stumble in your life? And they'll say, well, you know what? It's not my fault if they're weak. There's the problem within your heart. If it's causing them to stumble, get rid of it in your life today. That's just one issue. If the things in your life are causing someone to stumble, get it out. Paul said, look, it's all off. I can even drink it if I want to. I don't care, baby. But the truth is, I won't if it's going to cause someone else to stumble. In other words, we seek after putting others before ourselves. We seek after that. We say, well, it's not an easy thing to do. It's all about me. Hey, I understand. I understand that. But the truth is, he said, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Another thing we ought to seek after, and that is the presence of God. The best way to avoid the mistakes that are mentioned in Scripture is to pursue <coughs> the presence of God each day in your life. You won't have the strength to get by a temptation? Spend time with God. You won't have the strength to get through a tough decision or a tough, a tough time in your life? Spend time in the presence of God. There is no substitute for you spending one-on-one -on -one time in the presence of an almighty God. I love the fact that you're here, and I'm convinced that we ought to come together regularly to worship together. It's a command of God. It ought to be our heart's desire to come and worship. But I'm telling you this. There is no substitute for you spending time daily in the presence of an almighty God. Because when you do, it will change everything about you in your life. I told you just a few weeks ago, I think, but one of the things I used to do was I would read a, a proverb of every day. You know, there's 31 of them, so you have one every day. And I got lazy where I wasn't doing it. And I say I wasn't reading the book, but I would always read that and say, well, you've read those three or four times. I've read those several times. But I went back a few weeks ago, and every day, maybe we missed a day or two in that time. That's not the book, I'm just saying. Just for myself, you know, I'm going to read. And man, the wisdom in there. And how God uses it on target for something later on in that day, or something that morning, or something the next day. It's just blowing me away. I'm thinking, all along I've known that. Why did I neglect it in the first place? I think about the wisdom that he gives us. And you know what? How it changes your whole outlook of the day when you spend time with him. 
I'm excited about the Sunday school year. I already told you that this morning. I was excited about my class. I had a couple people say, how are you going to do it? You're going to preach on Sunday morning? You're going to preach on Wednesday night? You're going to preach on Sunday night? And most nights I will. And how are you going to do it? And I said, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I'm the one that's going to benefit. Because all it means is I'm going to have to discipline myself even better than I currently am. I ain't teaching class on Monday night, Christian doctrine. And I get think about all that. But you know what? At first, it kind of overwhelmed me. I thought, well, I mean, did I really jump in here with both knees? But this week, I'm thinking, what a blessing. And I'll tell you what God said to me in my heart, spoke to my heart, is it's time for you to get this one anyway. It's time for you every day to spend that time. And if I'm going to be used by Him, just like if you're going to be used by Him, it's about spending that time with Him every single day. I don't know when's the best time for you. But I can tell you this. Don't give your worst to God. Give him your best. I've said it many times. The reason I don't do my study late at night is because I fall asleep when I do. They make fun of me all the time on the couch. They said, Daddy, you're asleep. Go to bed. I said, no, I'm not asleep. I'm not doing something. I'm rest. I'm telling you, I can have a Bible in hand. I know it's embarrassing, but I can have a Bible in hand. I can just have a bag of chips in hand. I don't know, but they'll wake me up. Won't you go to bed? Because I'm telling you something. Once the day's over, if I slow down, it's over. I'm out. And so I know the best time for me. The best time for me is sometime early in the morning. Sometimes early in the morning because of my schedule at school. I can do it at school. I know the ACLU would be proud of that. Amen. But I can't. But it's my schedule. It's not every day. But the thing is, give him our best. And that's when I'm at my best, most alert, and ready to hear from him. It's about spending time in his presence. Spending time in his word. Pursuing his word, which we just basically covered. I was talking about spending time. I want to tell you this. If you have a question in life, God has an answer. If you're going through a struggle in life, God has an answer. If you're thinking that you're at your wit's end and you have nowhere to turn, God is standing, willing, able, and ready to answer. Spend time in His Word. The only way you're ever going to know the promises God has for us is to spend time in His Word. So, pursuing His presence, pursuing His Word, and pursuing a life that brings him glory. I'm going to go back to where we started. Whether be you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, here's what we need to contemplate. What I'm doing, how I'm serving, my study time, the words that I say, the things that I put in my life, the things that I do, the way I serve the church, the way I work every day, is it bringing glory to God? Because God has placed you, God has placed me here, this day and this time, to accomplish His will. You ever thought about it? I'll be 46 in a few days, two few days. And I don't think I'll live 46 more and make it 92. I know. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know. It doesn't concern me. I don't worry about that. But what does concern me is not how long, but am I doing what he wants me to do while I'm here? Because the truth is, a few years from now, whatever you call it, I'll be gone from here. And I'll stand before God. And what matters the most will be this. Did I live a life that brought glory and honor to Him? And we do it by looking at the things to avoid and the pursuing the things of God. And sometimes it means make a tough choice. Paul said, I'm almost finished, but Paul said this. He said, Look, it's lawful. I can eat meat, not eat meat, I can drink it, not drink it, it doesn't really matter. But it's profitable that I do. Thank you. There may be something in our lives that's not even a bad thing, but 
this getting in the way of what God wants us to do, it's the wrong thing at the wrong time to be in our lives. And he blew the So this is what I want to share with you. Like I said, when I read that uh, study this week, the gospel talks talk about why we were created and created to glorify him, well, I really had to think of all the things I'm doing. And i got lots of stuff going on. Are they all bringing glory to him? You say, all of it? Paul said, every single step <coughs> is to bring glory to God. And I had to evaluate and say, you know what? A lot of that stuff's not. God, speak to me. God, give me the strength to change it. Give me the wisdom to know where to change it. And lead me when I make that decision. That's what we need to be about doing. It's a cliche life for sure, but I'm going to tell you something. I want to know that while I was here, it brought glory to God, things that, came, that took place in my life. That's why we're created to bring glory 